Morning Labar. Welcome to Myanmar Today. I'm Henry Zin. We've got the latest news and reports. As the world fight against COVID-19, we'll take a look at coronavirus outbreaks' impact on China's political climate. The world may be in a battle against the coronavirus, but fisheries export continues despite the outbreak. A story coverage on 8th Industrial Technology and Machinery Show 2020. And the last report on World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development. We'll get to the reports in a while, but before that, let's take a look at the local news. President Uwe Mien and First Lady Do Chocho attended a ceremonial welcome of India's President Sri Ramnath Kovin in New Delhi, the capital of India, Thursday. He also held talks with Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi and witnessed signing the 10 Memorandum of Understandings. The MOUs include cooperation for the prevention of illegal trades of timber, protecting wildlife, development programs in Rakhine State, cooperation in medical researches, telecommunications, petroleum products, prevention of trafficking in persons and rehabilitation works. The Ministry of Health and Sports is conducting surveillance activities on the COVID-19 acute respiratory disease that has spread in China and other nations around the world. Surveillance is carried out at border entry exit checkpoints, hospitals, communities and private hospitals. According to a report from the National Health Laboratory, the following observations have been made at designated hospitals. A 23-year-old male patient in Musei Township Hospital and a 32-year-old male patient at Weibaki Specialist Hospital. The lab results of both patients reveal they do not have COVID-19. There are currently no patients under surveillance as of 8 p.m. on Thursday and neither has there been any confirmed cases of COVID-19. Surveillance activities have continued with full momentum. COVID-19 has spread across China and 38 other countries among our neighbours and around the world. The public is urged to adhere to the disease protection health information published by the Ministry of Health and Sports. A total of 16 voluntary returnees, including 9 males and 7 females, was accepted after the government verification procedures at the Ngakura Reception Center in Mount Dor Township, Rakhine State, on Tuesday. 10 out of 16 returnees were then given the NV cards provided with healthcare services and other provisions. Deputy Director Ute Mount, in charge of the Ngakura Reception Center, transferred the voluntary returnees to the Lapo Khan Transit Camp, where Camp in charge Director Uso Shui Aung received and provided them with rice, edible oil, salt, and kitchenware. These 16 returnees were then relocated to Ngan Chan Village in Mount Dor Township through the village tract administrator. That's all with the local news, and here's the first report on Myanmar today. Novel coronavirus outbreak in China has triggered a significant impact on China's political dynamic. The leadership in Hubei province got reshuffled and it reveals the shortcomings of some part of the governance. For in-depth insights, our reporter Aga Zhou reached out to the political analyst of the China Media Group in Beijing. The outbreak of the novel coronavirus in China has triggered a significant impact on China's various sectors. The impact covers from the economy to the political aspect and international relations. The President Xi Jinping also commented that the crisis is the test to reveal the shortcomings of the governance. Mr. Xu Jingdao, political analyst of the China Media Group, explained further on the crisis impact on the country's political dynamic. Well, on the impact uh, uh, of the politics uh, on the, in China, well, I think, you know, uh, if you listen to President Xi Jinping, he uh, said that, you know, this is a test, actually, uh, for the Chinese government, governance system, and it revealed the deficiencies and the shortcomings in the Chinese governance system. Uh, obviously, there are problems, there are loopholes. We need to do something to uh, plug the loopholes. It also reveals on the uh, uh, government level, you know, some of the problems, for example, some of the officials, they are not up to the expectation or the standard of the uh, uh, Chinese requirement, let's say. And uh, it's, uh, you know, they are put to test about their ability to govern and their ability uh, to deal with a crisis and uh, how much they are devoted to uh, fighting the virus. 
Inside China, President Xi Jinping reshuffled the leadership in Hubei province, which is the center of the outbreak due to the poor crisis management of the leadership. At the same time, the officials who showed great performance in handling the crisis received praise. Secondly, it is also a chance, I think, to uh, basically showcase the best and the brightest among the Chinese officials as well as the medical staff. For example, some of the Chinese uh, provinces and uh, cities they have done a great job in the prevention and the containment of the virus. So those officials are being praised for their uh, wisdom and for their timely response and for their responsible manner. And also for the medical staff, you know, they have uh, been on the front line risking their own life in order to save, li to save lives of other people. So they have earned the respect and also the support of the Chinese society. I think that they, uh, there is also understanding that the government should do more to invest in the health sector to improve, for example, the increased salary of our uh, medical staff. Uh, in this sense, we are going to build a strong defense system uh, in the health sector to protect the life, the health of the Chinese people. The head of China's COVID-19 expert team on Thursday said that China will contain the coronavirus epidemic by the end of April. It is also added that the first coronavirus case was confirmed in China, but the source of the virus might not have come from China, as many other countries are also reporting cases. Now, because of the political system over the past 40 years, it has set a strong and a solid record of developing economy and society. Uh, it has brought China to become the second largest economy from a backwater 40 years ago. So uh, it is a strong system. Uh, it's a resilient system. But, uh, you know, that doesn't mean it's perfect. It needs constantly to improve itself, to perfect itself, and to make it more workable for the Chinese society and the Chinese economy. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Chinese people are confident that uh, that's uh, what really uh, the long-term impact on the Chinese the politics of this uh, crisis. Countries around the world show firm support to China in the fight against the deadly epidemic. China is impressed by particularly the support of Japan, with Japanese officials claiming doing everything they can to help China. Heads of more than 160 countries and international organizations have shown their support through telegrams or letters, while the governments and peoples of many countries have donated much-needed supplies. This is Agajo reporting for Myanmar International Radio. That's a report on the coronavirus outbreak's impact on China's political climate. All right, we'll carry on with the next report on fisheries export here on Myanmar today. Despite the declining trade between Myanmar and China in the wake of COVID-19, Myanmar Fisheries Federation reports that it has maintained a stable trading business as the demand for fisheries products grows in China. However, the outbreak of the virus has slowed down the sale of fishery products in Myanmar. Willinson has more. As China is one of the most important trading partners for Myanmar, the outbreak of COVID-19 is directly responsible for decline of trade volume between the two nations recently. Though there are five main border passes between Myanmar and China, most of them have been closed down with the aim to control the further widespread of coronavirus. But Muse border is somehow still active to do trading business between Myanmar and China. Though most of the main export items have been halted for some time, resulting in a decline of trade volume between the two nations. Myanmar Fishery Federation reports that the fishery products export to China is not halted, but it is going as usual, seeing the slight increase in export volume this month, compared to the report from the last month. However, the fishery industry as a whole sees a sharp decline in Myanmar in the wake of coronavirus in China. Speaking to the media, Dr. Donandati, Vice Chairman of Myanmar Fishery Federation said, 
The border pass is not completely closed, as far as we know, but Qin Shui Ho is completely closed down. But the trading business is still going on from Muse border pass. We have complete data of how many products have entered China this month. Since 1st February till 236, 71 tons of factory products enter China through Muse Border Pass. This exported product is worth $6.13 million. Most of the products we export include chill factory products, frozen products, crops, and pangasias, along with other dry factory products. The trading activity has not stopped and it has been reported because there is still a huge consumer's demand in China, which only Myanmar is able to provide. The outbreak of the virus does not mean that the people don't eat anymore, but it can only reduce the amount in consuming, but it does not stop. According to the report by Myanmar Fishery Federation, the trade volume for fishery product last month hit only US dollar 2.4 million. But the trade volume in this month has surpassed last month's volume, seeing the increased volume from last month despite growing concern about the outbreak of the virus. But speaking on what are the impacts that fishery business in Myanmar face after the outbreak of coronavirus, Dr. Duna Nadin also said, the outbreak of the virus has certainly resulted in the decline in the sale of factory products across the country and a slight consumer's demand in the international market as well. But even though the sale has declined a little, it is going as usual. What we can say is that the impact COVID-19 has brought is not that serious in Myanmar as for now. Myanmar Fishery Federation recently signed MOU with China with the aim to collaborate each other in fishery business and also in the process of buying fishery products from Myanmar. And this mutual agreement signing is also known as GACC or General Administration of Custom of China. Under agreement between the two nations, the imports and export will be under the control of GACC. This agreement will also legalize export and import of other fishery products which are yet to be recognized as legal by the government. Under the agreement of this MOU, nearly 200 kinds of fishery products will be exported to China which China has already signed agreement to buy from Myanmar, including around 21 kinds of products from farming. Pengesias and oyster are some of the most demanded fishery products in China and Myanmar is ready to meet the market demand of China by exporting pengesias and oyster. This is Wilson for MI Radio. That's a report on fisheries export continuing despite COVID-19 outbreak. Let's have a look at the currency rates now from Myanmar's central bank and the stock exchange. One US dollar is at 1,446 jats. One Chinese renminbi is at 206 jats. One euro is at 1,576 jats. One pound sterling is at 1,878 jats. One Singapore dollar is at 1,035 jats. One Malaysian ringgit is at 342 jats. One Thai baht is at 45 jats. And the Indian rupee is at 20 jats. Gold is trading at $1,642. Silver is at $17. And brand crude oil is at $48. On the Yangon Stock Exchange, FMI is at 11500 MTSH is at 3950 MCB went up 200 and it's at 8400 FPB is at 23000 TMH is at 2900 Stay with us as we bring you more reports on Myanmar today. <music> 8th Industrial Technology and Machinery Show 2020 was held at the Damador Hall last week. The show was organized in collaboration with the Ministry of Planning and Finance and Ministry of Industry with support of the Federation of Myanmar Engineer Societies and Myanmar Promotional Services. David Tanner will tell us more. If we are to see the improvement and the evolution of our country, industrial technology plays a really important part. 
Industrial technology is the use of engineering and manufacturing technology to make production faster, simpler, and more efficient. With the motive to collaborate the impact of the local's industrial technology with the international's technology, the event has been the eighth time now. With that said, I have interviewed Dr. Zani Mamao, Managing Director for Myanmar Promotional Services, MPS. As this is the eighth time already, we are very comfortable to hold this event as it has been credited for having great connections between local industrial technology companies and services with the international ones. This event is to share the vital information about market conditions, technological improvements and advices to have a really good flow of industrial technological advancement in parallel with other countries. There will be about over 120 showrooms with about 70 companies from international as well as locals. So most importantly, we really want to promote the Myanmar's industrial products to the international country and have its own marketplace. Moreover, if there will be more showcases of the industrial technologies from other countries, our local companies can learn and grow through it and produce better quality products. Dr. Zarni also added on the Industrial Technology Innovations Competition and how he expects regarding it. I don't really expect really big and advanced innovations. I mean, it's great if we are to achieve those in this competition, but what I really expect is the simple innovations that improve our local's daily life. Maybe it might be innovation about food processing and production, or we could also expect food packaging and preserving industrial technology. In my perspective, it is really important to start from the basics, and I hope this industrial technology innovations competition triggers those innovative ideas of the students and the youths. In the event, I also interviewed one of the companies showcasing its advanced pharmaceutical technology machines and how it could help improve the industry of Myanmar as well. Mr. Robin O, Managing Director of Repasta, will explain more about it. Yeah, I feel that in Myanmar, the pharmaceutical industry is now growing and there is a very big potential for Myanmar to play in a very important role not only locally but also in the international market. To do that, the expertise of people like Telstar would be able to bring the Myanmar industry to this level by providing the right concept in reaching the right goal. In every country, the pharmaceutical industry is a necessity. And in Myanmar, as I know, even today, more than 90% of the pharmaceutical products are still imported. So the potential for local manufacturing is very, very, very big. Wu Omie, Vice Chairman of Federation of Myanmar Engineering Societies, also told NY Radio his perspective regarding this event. When I explore around the event, I am really glad to see most of the locals' products. On the other hand, I also experience the international products and technology, which is fascinating. I mean, if more people know about Myanmar's products, there will be more business opportunities. And we could also save a lot of budgets that our country spend in international exports if we were to use the local exports. How could this kind of industrial technology and machinery show would have an impact in our country will also be added on by Wu Omien. We have lots of benefits by holding these kinds of events. These kinds of events should be also held frequently. And another thing is that as the year comes by, we should also improve the innovations of our country and promote through this kind of event and have a really good connection with international market. Be more profitable for our country in a great way. Reporter David Turner reporting from Myanmar International Radio. That's a report on the 8th Industrial Technology and Machinery Show 2020. And here's the last report on World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development. 
The World Engineering Day will be held for three days starting on the 4th of March, for the first time in Myanmar and the world. The day's aim is to highlight the achievements of engineers and engineering in our modern world and improve public understanding of how engineering and technology are central to modern life and sustainable development. David Hanna has the details. The World Federation of Engineering Organizations, WFEO, is the international organization for the engineering profession, founded on 4th March in 1968. WFEO brings together national engineering institutions from 100 nations and represents more than 30 million engineers. At the 40th meeting of the UNESCO, it has been confirmed that the World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development will take place on 4th March 2020. We will hear more about the event from Wu Aumie, who is the president of the Federation of Myanmar Engineering Societies. No, World Engineering Day. The 40th General Conference of UNESCO has adopted the resolution to proclaim on 4th March every year regarding World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development in November 2019. The World Federation of Engineering Organizations WFEO proposed on 4th March as the World Engineering Day, the founding day of the Federation, as part of the 50th anniversary celebration of the Federation in 2018. This is an opportunity to celebrate the important contributions of engineers and engineering towards a sustainable development and modern life. The World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development will be celebrated annually starting from 2020. The World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development will be celebrated for three consecutive days. The details of the event will be summarized by Wu Aumie as well. On the first day of the World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development, the opening ceremony will be held at the Federation of Myanmar Engineering Society's building's third floor's conference room. After the opening, the keynote speech will be delivered by Dr. Amien with the topic of engineering education for sustainable development. After that, we will continue the next part of our event at Myanmar Engineering Council on Kayibin Street. From there, we will be opening the showrooms and booths around 1.30 p.m. It will consist of departmental showrooms, Federation of Myanmar Engineering Society members' showroom. At those booths, we will be showcasing the things related to those departments and what they are doing for the sustainable development of our country. With that said, I have also interviewed Dr. Charlie Dan, who is the president of the Myanmar Engineering Council for why engineering is being promoted to a career that is important factor for all the women and young ladies. Let's find out. Especially the, in the other countries, the, the women's and the, the ladies' participation in the engineering is very declining. And more and more of the, the ladies are uh, not interested in our engineering and engineering educations. This is the, the challenges and the problem in the other countries. Therefore, we'd like to encourage, steady our engineering educations and also uh, participation in our engineering job or engineering activities and engineering project. This is very important for us. At the moment, it is uh, a lot of the uh, women and a lot of the ladies and a lot of the girls is uh, participating in our engineering program. But we are worried because, uh, as you know, the engineering job is, uh, it is very dangerous, very dirty and uh, extreme to the sound and extreme to the other environment. Why is this kind of World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development so important for all the nations will also be explained by Dr. Charlie. If you want to build your nation, you need the engineering. And also it's a global issue. Therefore, the, they are launching for the World Engineering Day in our country. Not only in our country, but also in the international uh, platform. The reason is to uh, awareness all the people 
why engineers and engineering is a very important for the nation building. All of my students, especially the young people from the all technical university, uh, all from the technical institutes, uh, we like to invite them to participate in this very important meetings, very important conference, very important shows. It is for them. It is targeted for them, for the nation building purpose. Reporter David Tanner reporting from Myanmar International Radio. That's all we have for today's reports. Now let's keep up with the world with international news here on Myanmar today. A health crisis struck China on the cusp of the new year. Wuhan, a metropolis of 11 million residents in central China's Hubei province, would become the epicenter of a new coronavirus. On January 23rd, Chinese authorities placed a lockdown on Wuhan, a transportation hub with a population 1.3 times that of New York, to contain the disease. Rapidly rising numbers of infected cases put the local health care system under tremendous stress. An unprecedented rescue mission and nationwide battle against the epidemic began. We have a video clip here. Let's take a look. Wuhan's war on COVID-19. Wuhan, a metropolis of 11 million residents in central China's Hubei province. This winter, the city is fighting an unprecedented defensive battle. The enemy is the novel coronavirus. By January 23rd, there were 495 confirmed cases in Wuhan. <laughs> to minimize the spread of the virus, the city, with a population 1.3 times that of New York, was locked down. China then began a large-scale rescue mission. On January 24th, the first batch of medical teams from outside Hubei arrived. Meanwhile, Chinese companies were ordered to build a 1,000-bed hospital within 10 days, and a second soon followed. On January 25th, China held a top-level meeting on the outbreak, and confidence in winning the battle was expressed. Unfortunately, the disease continued to spread. By February 2nd, the total confirmed cases in Wuhan surpassed 5,000. The next day, the construction of three temporary hospitals began. Since February 7th, the Chinese government has called on 19 other provinces and municipalities to send medics to cities in Hubei. On February 9th alone, 6,000 medical workers landed at Wuhan's airport. On February 11th, the total number of confirmed cases in the city neared 20,000. Two days later, the Chinese Air Force sent cargo planes carrying 1,400 more medics from the army. Over 1,500 medical workers have been infected, and some laid down their lives to save others. To plug a shortage of protective suits, masks, and other medical supplies, Chinese manufacturers from various industries were mobilized. The daily capacity of mask production was raised from 8 million to over 50 million. Huge volumes of material supplies headed for Wuhan. By February 23rd, China had dispatched over 330 medical teams, incorporating 41,600 medics to the virus in Hubei. Wuhan has built two infectious disease hospitals, increased the number of designated hospitals to over 40, and put in use 13 temporary hospitals, bringing the total number of available beds to over 40,000, while preparing another 70,000 beds at quarantine sites. No one is left unattended. Fortunately, new confirmed cases in Wuhan have finally started to decline. The dawn of victory has appeared. WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said, At its source appear to have bought the world time, even though those steps have come at greater cost to China itself. It is a special war between humans and a new virus. Defending Wuhan is protecting China and the whole world. No victory should be hastily announced until there is a complete win. 
China's Beidou navigation satellites are helping the country fight the novel coronavirus epidemic with high precision from space. When China was building the two makeshift hospitals, Hoshenshan and Leishenshan, in Wuhan, the epicenter of the epidemic, equipment based on the Beidou navigation satellite system provided high precision positioning service and accelerated the construction. Drones based on the BDS have been utilized to spray disinfectant. Police in Reitang, East China's Jiangxi province, used BDS-based drones to patrol crowded places to prevent intensive contact between people. China's Ministry of Transport sent epidemic prevention and transportation service information to more than 6 million vehicles via the BDS terminals and provided services for the transportation of emergency materials to the areas most affected by the epidemic. And that's all we have for today. Thanks for joining me on Myanmar Today. I'm Henry Zin. Have a great weekend, everyone. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.